Good afternoon. Welcome to the second uh, special lecture of Vigyan Vidushi 2021. Today's special lecture will be delivered by Professor Nandini Trivedi. She is a professor of physics at Ohio State University, working in the area of theoretical condensed matter physics. It is my privilege to introduce her today. Professor Nandini Trivedi did her undergraduate studies at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and moved to Cornell University for her graduate studies, where she worked on transport and disordered systems. She was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and later joined the State University of New York. She started her career at Argonne National Laboratory as an assistant scientist and later spent a decade as a faculty in the theoretical physics department at TIFR. In 2004, Trivedi joined Ohio State University as a professor in the department of physics. Professor Nandini Trivedi uses analytical and quantum Monte Carlo techniques to study strongly correlated and topological phenomena in condensed matter and cold atoms. She is very original in her research and has received several honors for her work. Noteworthy among them are elected fellow of the American Physical Society 2004, Simmons Foundation Fellow 2015, Ohio State University Distinguished Scholar 2019. In the year 2020, she has been elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science a special honor that recognizes leading scientists and innovators. The citation reads as follows. For her contribution to the theoretical understanding of quantum matter, innovative use of quantum Monte Carlo techniques, and close experimental collaborations. Today, she will talk to us about the strange world of fractionalized quantum numbers in quantum matter. Without taking more time, I invite her to deliver the lecture. Well, thank you so much, Sumedha, for this <clears throat> very gracious introduction. Uh, and thank you, Vandana, for the invitation to give a talk at this uh, very special Vigyan Vidushi Forum, which is really one of its kind. Um, so I wish I could uh, be actually there in person, seeing all your bright faces. Uh, because it was only a few years ago that I was in your place um, as an 11th grader or as an MSc student. So um, it's, it's really, uh, uh, I'm hoping for more interaction as the talk goes on um, to uh, be able to hear what some of your questions are. Okay, so let me get started. Um, as Sumedha said, I work in condensed matter physics. Uh, which is a branch of physics where uh, we know what the elements are, electrons and uh, atoms and so on. But nevertheless, it's the problems are still unsolved because from the interactions of these electrons, new things can emerge, which you could not have predicted just by knowing what two electrons do. It's a bit like society, you know, it. Uh, though much simpler than society because each electron is identical. In society, each person themselves is quite an individual in their own way, but nevertheless, society can emerge in all kinds of um, new types of organizations. So that's what condensed matter physics is about. And I'm going to tell you one specific journey today, one specific story. Uh, so broadly right now, condensed matter is going through a very important revolution. And that's where it's opening up new fields for young people like you, where quantum materials and quantum information, these were two very separate fields. Um, they are starting to come together. And we are going from an era where we have computers which are based on bits, zeros and ones, that's what runs your uh, cell phones, uh, to qubits, which are linear superpositions of these zeros and ones with the possibility of um, not just storing a large amount of information, but really viewing information in a totally, totally different way. And I will give you a little glimpse of these things. 
Okay, so let me start in 11th grade. Um, you know, I was generally interested in science, biology, chemistry. You know, we, do, we don't differentiate like that when we are young. We are just interested and curious. But around 11th grade, I started getting attracted by physics, especially by the simplicity and elegance of concepts, the universality. There was an inverse square law in gravity. There was also an inverse square law in electromagnetism, in electrostatics. So this kind of universality caught my attention. And I was fascinated by the power of theory, the Newton's law to be able to predict the trajectory of a rocket to the moon. And Apollo 13, which talks about how there's a mis, uh, mishap and how these astronauts are brought back was absolutely riveting. If that's a movie you haven't seen, you absolutely must. And now more recently, Mangal Mission, with the power of so many women scientists on the team leading the effort was just so inspiring. So I was born, I'm starting at the very early stages in a very small town in um, Northeast of India. And um, I was looking for new challenges in, um, when I was in grade 11 and transitioning from this small town to a big city, New Delhi, it was exciting, it was scary, and I was having to learn to survive on my own. And I got my first shock in the first semester in IIT Delhi when I landed a C in physics and a C in math. And I was totally devastated because this was my, going to be my life. You know, I was so passionate about doing physics. And then those are the two subjects that are the bedrock of doing physics, uh, I, I do very poorly. And um, you know that's a picture of me in, um, in 11th grade with some of my friends. And I want to point this out because everyone has a different journey, but these journeys are always very, have ups and downs and you know, many side branches. And it, we should just uh, embrace these journeys because that's what sort of molds us into who we become. So at this point, I did much soul searching. You know, there are many paths emerge. Should I still continue doing this? Am I any good? Or should I take some new paths? All of these questions come to one's mind. And this is where um, it's really important to ask yourself why you are doing what you are doing. And you should never do it to please anyone else. That will just break down at some point. So I went through such soul searching and I asked myself, do I really like physics that much? And that summer when I was at home, um, I read the Feynman lectures and I was so inspired and I decided, well, come what may, this is going to be the subject I will go after. But then that's not enough. You need a strategy. You can't continue to be doing poorly and saying that's what I want to do. So you know, you need a strategy, you need to identify the problem, and you do, should not make it an isolated um, feeling because that's what challenges make you do. They isolate you, they give you a sense of helplessness. And it's important at that point to reach out and ask for help without downing yourself too much. So it was a very important lesson I learned early on. And, um, what is interesting is that that early lesson stayed with me. So, you know, later on, let's say I had issues about um, getting my grant. I had issues about um, getting along with my advisor. None of those seem unsurmountable because at a young age, I felt I was able to get over this very harsh first blow. And, uh, you know, with all of these things in place, uh, my problems really did get corrected after uh, just one semester. So that was heartening. Okay, so another issue that I think might be of interest to all of you as you are stepping into um, uh, finding a career, you know, you might ask, 
this is sort of um, not always a very logical procedure, but I just thought I will try to share some kind of a graph, which is, you know, we all like to think in plots and um, equations and so on. So maybe a plot would uh, display how I picked a career in hindsight. So you're kind of looking at two axes. How good am I at something? What are my abilities? And how interested am I in that? And on these axes, you can put a few things. So for me, I put me and cooking. I'm a good cook, even though I say so myself. And so I'm very good. I'm kind of high on this axis, but I'm not that interested in making cooking my career. So that doesn't kind of go up here. It's, it's way on toward the right on this axis. Then on the in interest axis, me and swimming. I'm really interested in swimming. I'm, I just enjoy seeing all kinds of competitions, swimming sports and so on. But I'm a terrible swimmer. Every time I try, I almost feel like I'm going to drown after many trials. So that's not happening with me as a career, but it's up there as my interest. Now with physics, let me draw a diagonal line like this. I started somewhere above the line. So I was much more interested in physics than I was good at it. And that's where you want to go first. You want to kind of open up the passions that you are, or the things that excite you, the things you care about, the things that keep you thinking about it at night or on weekends or on a walk. And then bit by bit, I started moving toward the line. Me and physics comes closer here, and then over time, you enjoy it more and more, you get better at it, you're moving up along the line. So that's uh, sort of um, gives you a glimpse of how at least I was trying to move through this huge op number of options. And today there are even more options and actually space for creating and imagining new jobs and new careers and new pathways that didn't even exist. So that's the real power of the times you guys are living in. So the other aspect I feel, especially for women in science or women in careers is balancing family and career. For men too, this is important. Um, and they need to do more of that balancing part as well. So I have two daughters and just a few thoughts on what are some elements that help in bringing family and career together. Um, you need a supportive partner. Um, and also it's useful to be flexible. If something is not working out at that moment head on, it's sometimes useful to be flexible and then trying to still not to give up your um, ideas, but to kind of, uh, you know, keep the bias, but try different pathways. And then, you know, you can't do everything at every moment in time. So prioritizing, organizing and simplifying and networking, like I said, asking for help, but even not just help, networking. Um, and we tend to often not do enough of it, but both professionally and with friends and trying to face challenges as thoughtfully as possible. And finally, I just uh, wrote this, smell the roses. That's just a way of my saying that, um, let not uh, just uh, all these heavy things take up all your time, but take time to have your hobbies, you know, smell the roses, take your walks, go for runs, do yoga, whatever it is you like to do. Okay, so with that, uh, let me now dive into uh, the signs that I will, um, that I want to share with you. Uh, and I'm happy at the end, uh, you know, to discuss more of uh, the challenges we face uh, as we choose uh, our paths. Okay, so condensed matter physics is, to me, it was, I came to it again through some rattling, because in the beginning, what I was fascinated with were black holes and astrophysics and um, particle physics, because these are in the news a lot more. It just 
the news media is fascinated by that. And that's what we hear a lot about. And condensed matter was something I didn't know much when I went for my graduate studies. And it was only um, by hearing seminars and um, talks that I started getting exposed to it. So I want to tell you about the single hook that got me. And that was fractionalization. So let me just in a quick bird's eye view, tell you what are some things that can happen. And then I'll tell you one example to show you how fraction, what is fractionalization and how does it occur? Okay, so an electron, we all know that, is a fundamental particle, right? Um, but in a, in a material, and that means if you take many electrons and make them interact, so in two dimensions, a very strange phenomena happens where an electron can fractionalize into three lumps. And this has experimental consequences. It leads to the fractional quantum Hall effect. So this was, I was like, whoa, this can happen? This was absolutely unbelievable when I first heard about it. Because you see, courses are naturally going to be limited because you, know, you have to learn things step by step. But the fact that there could be something so unfathomable at the end of it was just astounding when I heard about this in graduate school. So this happened, the discovery of fractional quantum Hall effect happened in 1981 or 1983 or something when I was in graduate school. And that was already pretty, um, uh, pretty novel. But more things can happen. An electron has charge and spin. And remarkably, these are always tied with each other. This is part of the fundamental property of an electron that can separate in a material. So if you make electrons move in one dimensional carbon nanotubes, the spin and charge move with different velocities. Okay, so another thing is uh, you have magnets. And when you excite magnets, they produce spin waves. And these spin waves carry angular momentum in units of integer angular momentum, one, two, three, et cetera. But rather remarkably, uh, this is part of the story I will tell you today, this uh, spin wave can fractionalize. And another thing you would have learned in, in your ENM is that no monopoles exist. So del dot B, which would have been equal to the monopole charge is zero. But again, in quantum materials, materials called spin ice, you can have uh, both positive and negatively charged monopoles. So this is the big world of quantum matter. And this is only a part of it. There are many other aspects of it, but this is the aspect focusing on fractionalization. Okay. So now let me, um, you know, I don't want to just leave you with impressions. I want to tell you one very clear story so you can carry it with you. And if you are excited about it, look up more resources. So quant uh, quantum matter, the word quantum. So quantum is obviously important. Let me start at the part level of one particle. So that's the quantum mechanics of the 1920s. And this is something many of you would probably know about the wave particle duality. Then there was another revolution, a second revolution of quantum mechanics in the 60s, where we learn about two particle entanglement. And today uh, we are moving the story forward to many more than two, like N. N can be on the order of billions and billions of particle entanglement. And this is where we are creating. Uh, using aspects of symmetry, topology, new states are emerging in real materials. So these are materials that you know chemists would make and physicists not just would make, but they make. Okay, so let's start with the one particle duality, particle wave duality. So this is something we are all faced with, you know, you're going along and now you're given two choices. Which road should I take? And clearly, if it's a classical particle like a P, 
and the P has to is confronted with these two slits, it has to pick one of the paths. So what you see on the other side when you're shooting these P's through the two slits is an image of this kind. It's basically an image of the two slits where the P's pile up. We also know that if we had water waves, then uh, the waves coming out of the two slits emerge as circular waves. Um, and then these waves interfere, producing a light and dark pattern of, interfere, of interference. And we have seen this in a pond, you know, you throw a pebble, you throw two pebbles, and that creates this beautiful interference pattern. But now we come to the question of an electron. And we have a source here, which shoots one electron at a time. So it shoots an electron, which has to decide what is, which path should I take between the two slits and then emerge on the detector where it is detected as, um, as the electron. So let's see, when I was in um, an undergraduate, this experiment had not been done. It was in Feynman lectures, and this is the lecture that convinced me to continue in physics. Um, that was a Gedanken experiment, meaning a thought experiment. And even that was so evocative. But today we have the real experiment by Tonomura, and uh, it's on YouTube, you can take a look at it. And it's exactly that experiment where um, these um, uh, electrons are being detected on the detector, okay? And uh, what you see are these dots. So every time there is a dot, you know you have detected an electron at that location. And only then the next electron comes through the slits. So it's not like the water wave. It's just like the P experiment, but let's see what happens at the end. So you keep doing this. It takes a long time and I'm going to speed it up. So you do this, uh, this experiment takes about 30 minutes or so, but you do this, continue on and on. You keep getting more and more dots. And then you would have expected two slits of dots if it was a P-like story, like the electrons were a P, but no, that's, ah, sorry. That's not what happens. Um, what you see at the end is this emerge, is this very beautiful interference uh, pattern that has been created by single electron waves going through both the slits. If you try to look which slit the electron went through, the pattern washes away. So only when the wave function of the electron is able to uh, explore both the paths, you get this um, interference pattern showing that the electron behaves both as a particle, that's in the way it is detected as a dot, but also as a wave in that it creates the amplitudes create this interference pattern. Okay, so that's at least at, even at the level of a single particle, the quantum world is amazing in that it is able to explore so many pathways. And this aspect is what is leading to the use of a qubit for quantum information. Um, if you want to um, see more on this at a, at a popular level, um, you can look at this YouTube uh, video that I have on my quantum mom, which was in response to my daughter asking me if I could be in two places at the same time. So she wanted me to be a quantum mom when she was little and not go away to give talks to different places. Today, it's nice. I can be a quantum mom sitting here being a Zoom, Zoom mom. Okay, now come to two particles. So two particles can also, of course, interfere, but there's another special property called entanglement. And if this is something you haven't heard, it's worth Googling more and learning more about this fundamentally important property called entanglement. Okay, so what is an entangled state? Let's say I have two spins, both are up, sitting on two sides. So if I create a quantum state of this kind, this is a separable state. It's a product state, which is not entangled. On the other hand, if I create a linear superposition of states like this, I have 
an upspin at site one, a downspin at site two, with a phase factor in between, it could be minus or some other complex phase, down one, up two, that becomes an entangled state because I can't separate it into what is happening at site one and what is happening at site two. The wave functions between the two sites are entangled. And this is called a bell pair. And such bell pairs are really important resources for, um, for uh, quantum information. Okay, so um, this aspect of the bell pair, so what is exciting about the bell pair? You create a bell pair and send it, send one, um, uh, one spin to say person A and another spin to person B, Init that person does a measurement. Let's say A measures the spin to be in the up state. B will necessarily measure it to be in the down state. If A measures it to be in the down state, B will necessarily measure it to be in the up state. Now, what is remarkable about this is A and B can be made to sit much further than the distance that light could travel in that time. And yet, with absolute certainty, A and B will know that their spins are opposite. Uh, we'll, we'll determine it to be so uh, in an experiment. And so this very weird non-classical correlation was, um, as Einstein called it, spooky action at a distance. And people tried very hard to understand this by some classical theories by saying, you know, maybe the reason this spooky action is happening is because we don't have all the information in quantum mechanics. But all that has been eliminated now with very careful experiments. So um, let me just uh, point out. So the ex this was Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen raising the question in 35. Bell managed to make it a mathematical uh, inequality which if, um, you know, and in terms of this an inequality, experiments could test the validity of quantum mechanical correlations. And so a sequence of experiments were done starting in 82, but then the two objects, these are two, actually in the experiments, these are photon polarizations. They were made to, uh, to uh, get further and further apart in this uh, uh, Chinese experiment, the two photon detectors were 1200 kilometers apart. So these are no longer tabletop experiments and they are still detecting these non-local classical correlations. So ultimately, this is another weirdness of quantum mechanics. It is probabilistic and it has these non-local correlations. And the reason we are getting interested in this is that they form a resource for quantum information. I'll not say much about that, but that's something for you, get, you to read more about. Okay, so I want to, there's already quite a bit of work on two particle entanglement. So the open questions are with multi-particle entanglement. So that's where I want to go next. And the questions uh, one might ask are, can we get entangled states in materials? Why are such entangled states interesting? And then why are such entangled states useful? So let me give you quick answers and then um, give you more specific ideas about these. So yes, we can get such uh, entangled states in materials and they, are, they arise in a new state of matter called quantum spin liquids. So that's the story I want to go into in more detail. And um, the reason they are interesting from a fundamental point of view is they, are, they have actually produced for us a new paradigm in terms of which we define phases of matter. So usually when you talk about phases of matter, if you, know, you would say, oh yeah, and at high temperatures, you have a gas, you lower the temperature, you get a liquid, you lower the temperature even more, you get um, a solid or a crystal. 
And that has been the standard paradigm at low temperatures. Um, the system always breaks a symmetry. At high temperatures, the gas was in a completely rotational state and translationally invariant state. And uh, then at low temperatures, the system breaks this continuous symmetry and um, picks up a certain specific position. So it breaks um, continuous translational symmetry and takes on a discrete translational symmetry. So the symmetry has been lowered as you go to lower temperatures. So there's a breaking of symmetry. Um, in a magnet at high temperatures, the spin can point in any direction. You have a paramagnet. As you go to low temperatures, the spins decide, let's say, to point up in a ferromagnet. And so it has broken time reversal symmetry. So like this, at low temperatures, the system always goes into a lower symmetry state. And this has been the standard paradigm. And these entangled states actually produce a new situation where there is no such breaking of symmetry and yet some new state of matter is being produced. And the question now becomes, how do we understand these? How do we define these? And finally, they, as I said, they have been, uh, they are really important for quantum computation. And that is what is driving a lot of development across disciplines, not just physics, but also mathematics, quantum information, computer science, and so on. Okay, so as I said, my topic for today will be a quantum spin liquid. And these are some things to keep in mind. It's a new state of matter. So I want to say that very categorically so that um, we all are on the same page. Um, it is different from anything we have seen before. It is not a magnet. It is not a superconductor. It is not some new kind of charge order. And yet it is exotic. Okay, how so is going to re get revealed. Okay, so let's go back to the electron, which has charge and spin. Half H bar um, spin and charge E. And we know that two electrons um, repel each other in vacuum. That's very important. Now, in a solid, strange things can happen. For example, two electrons can actually attract each other, which is bizarre, right? Given what we know about uh, elect uh, electrostatics or, or ENM uh, and this repulsion between like charges, the fact that two charges, two like charges can actually pair up is already astounding. And this leads to not just paired electrons, but these paired electrons can carry current with no resistance. They make a superconductor. So this um, is itself a fascinating story, which I won't go into today, but I have a YouTube Science Sunday uh, video you can look at on, the, on a popular account of how su what superconductivity is and what are its uses and so on. Okay. But today, the story I want to tell you is this electron with charge and spin that can separate in an in insulator that we call a Mott insulator. So just like this um, little cartoon showed, the spin and charge are getting separated. Okay, so how, where, let's position ourselves so we understand what these Mott insulators are. So as you all know, a conductor allows electricity to flow. So here is a copper wire, metals are conductors. Plastics on the other hand are insulators. And this electrical current is actually the flow of billions and billions of electrons. So the way it occurs is you have an atom with its charge bound to it. When you put many atoms together, the electrons from one atom can hop to the other and that hopping essentially allows these electrons to travel like a wave and 
conduct electricity. In an insulator, these electrons remain bound on the individual atoms and therefore there is no charge flow. Okay, all well and good, we understand that. So we have the metals, there's charge flow and spin flow. We have these, now I'm adding the word band insulator. When we usually say, oh, this is insulating, what we mean is a band insulator, like silicon, plastic, so on. No charge flow and no spin flow. And I'm going to now tell you about another insulator called a Mott insulator. This occurs in materials like nickel oxide, ruthenium chloride, this uh, complicated material with copper in it. In these materials, no charge can flow, but spin can flow. So how does that happen? Okay. So if you look at the resistance, of these different uh, kinds of materials. Uh, resistance is basically you have your, your material, you pass current through that by applying a voltage across it, and you measure the ratio of the voltage to the current that gives you the resistance. And the resistance changes with temperature. At high temperature, the resistance is high because the electrons are bumping a, a uh, bumping against a lot of the lattice vibrations, but at low temperatures, it plateaus and comes to a constant, which is uh, tells you about how much disorder and imperfections you have. Okay, in an insulator, on the other hand, the resistance at low temperatures doesn't plateau. It goes higher and higher and essentially diverges as the temperature gets lower. And both the band and the MOT insulators show this behavior. So that's how the charge is getting gapped out. But MOT insulators have something more. They can have very unusual magnetic properties. For example, if you take a lattice of atoms, in a band insulator, you have two electrons per site and that completely fills up this lattice. I'm just imagining one orbital so if that orbital is filled with two electrons, that orbital is completely filled. They can't move at all. But you can have another situation where the orbitals are only half filled. So there's only one electron per site. And yet, in principle, this up electron could move here because these two electrons would then have opposites. They can't move if the spin is the same. That is. Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, two electrons can't be in this, two electrons of the same spin can't be in this in a given state, but two different spin electrons can be there. So, um, so this up electron can in principle move, but there is strong Coulomb repulsion in certain materials like I showed you. And in that case, what you get is a static charge, there's no uh, ability for the charge to move. So you get um, sort of these electrons that are stuck, but their spin can orient in different directions. There is, There are low energy spin excitations. So in that way, the spin and charge have been separated. This system is a MOT insulator, no charge motion, but it has magnetism. It has anti-ferromagnetism. The spins are aligned in opposite directions and it can have low energy spin excitations. Okay, so let me uh, stop here for a few minutes, take questions and then I'll go on. We still haven't come to the spin liquids. So at this point, I have at least told you what is a MOT insulator and that it has unusual magnetic properties. Okay, go ahead if there are questions. There, uh, hi, there are quite a few questions. So few people have asked, what is jiggling of atoms? And some have asked, what is spin flow? What is spin? Flow. Okay, so um, jiggling of atoms. So when you take any uh, solid, you know, like um, at this point, you know, I don't know what, what is a nice solid you can think of. I always think of my iPhone. That's something always handy. It is made up of say silicon, silicon atoms. And um, at zero temperature, these atoms are sitting on very definite sites. 
about five angstroms apart. But as you raise the temperature, these atoms will start to oscillate about their equilibrium positions. And these oscillations then produce um, sort of lattice waves, lattice vibrations. So if an electron is trying to move through the, through, uh, through the system, um, then it will get scattered by these uh, lattice excitations. So uh, say in a copper wire, you know, where electrons are actually able to move from one side to another, they can't move unperturbed. Um, they are perturbed by these lattice fluctuations. Okay, that's one thing. And then spin flow. Spin flow, I am not exactly sure where you heard me say spin flow, but here in this system here, uh, because of the repulsion, this up electron will not be able to move to the down site, to the site which has a down electron because there's strong repulsion. But the spins um, can, on, on individual sites, the spins can, flux, can, um, can uh, oscillate. And in that way, you can have spin uh, fluctuations, just like the lattice vibrations. You can also have spin vibrations. Uh, should we take one or two more? Sure. Okay. So, uh, what is the relation or difference between lutetian liquids and Mott insulator? Okay, that's a longer discussion. Maybe that will come uh, later. At this point, just focus on the Mott insulator. So, there's one on Mott insulator. What is net magnetic field through a Mott insulator? Do they allow current flow? Uh, so there is no net magnetic field. Uh, the system, as you see, has equal numbers of up and down electrons. Okay, so in that sense, it has no um, total magnetization. But if you look at, a, there's a very particular ordering, nonetheless. Every odd site has an up electron, every even site. So if I label them one, two, three, four, so every even site has a down electron. So it has a sub lattice order and that can be detected. So this is a system that has long range order. Uh, but in terms of the a second part of the question, there's no current flow. You can't move, if you apply a voltage difference, you can't push current through such a system. But if you apply a spin chemical potential, you can push a uh, spin through the system. So a system like a Mott insulator can carry spin and it can carry heat, but it cannot carry charge. So uh, again, in terms of these three transports, a metal can carry charge, it can carry spin, like if you apply a small spin imbalance that can also flow through the electrons. If you apply a small thermal gradient, energy can also be transported in a metal. In a band insulator, you can transport no charge, you can't transport charge, but you can transport energy. In a Mott insulator, you can transport both energy and spin. Okay. Great. So these were all very, very good questions. So keep asking. Now you might say, what, what is, so let us look at these two spin problem. Um, and there's some energy of alignment, which decides what kind of alignment will happen between these two spins. And that is given by some interaction of this kind, S dot S, uh, with some strength in front. And if this J is positive, then you can see the two spins would like to align in opposite directions, anti-align, because one SIZ will give you half and the other one gives you minus half. You get a negative number, which means the energy is going down and you're trying to find the minimum energy state. But it turns out that's not the full story. That's just the Z component of the spins. There are also the X and Y components. And the X and Y components can be written as these raising and lowering operators. And if you haven't seen this before, it's fine. All I'm trying to say is that just having an up-down state is not the ground state 
of an interaction Hamiltonian that looks like this. The X and Y terms, for example, can take a, a, a spin configuration where you have up and down opposite and just switch them to uh, the green, the site one becomes up and site two becomes down. It can switch it. These are called quantum fluctuations. So what, again, I won't go through all of this algebra. It's very easy to show that if you have two spins, they can either form a singlet or a tri triplet. And let's say they, you look at the singlet state. Uh, in the singlet state, the total spin is zero. And you can show that S dot S is equal to minus three quarters. So that means that the, just the up-down state had an energy of minus a quarter in units of J, but actually the ground state can do much better than just up and down. It can form a singlet. And a singlet is precisely that entangled bell pair I showed you. And this singlet has an even lower energy by, um, uh, it goes down to minus three quarters. So that's what the system does. It does not form just an up-down state, it forms a singlet. And if you have many spins in the system, they can form all patterns of singlets. You know, you can pair, let's say I have six spins in the system, three up, three down. You can form this pattern, you can form that pattern, this third pattern and so on. And a spin, uh, a spin liquid, is basically a linear superposition of all of these patterns of singlets. So what we have here is a state that has no magnetic moment because it's a singlet. Singlet, the total spin is zero. And at the same time, it does not have any kind of magnetic order, even that sub-lattice order that the antiferromagnet has had. It has no long range magnetic order of any kind. So what I have produced for you is a quantum paramagnet. And you might say, okay, so usually we are trying to make magnets with high transition temperatures. And now you're telling me you've made a paramagnet where there's no magnetism at all. And somehow this is supposed to be interesting. And the answer is yes, this state this spin liquid state, which is this entangled soup of um, singlets, is a state that has a very particular topological order and long range quantum entanglement. You can even just see that emerging from these pictures. And this is the part I uh, won't go into in too much detail, but the topology is where the fundamental science uh, in this state resides. And what topology means is sort of captured by this uh, coffee mug. You can see that by smooth deformations, the coffee mug can be deformed into this vara, right? We call it a donut in the US and it's a vara in, uh, in India. I love my varas. This is the South Indian vada with the hole. And um, that basically the two are topologically connected, meaning by smooth transformations, you can go from one to the other. And these kinds of structures are sitting in this quantum spin liquid. The importance of that, of a topological state, is that precisely you saw how little imperfections affected how this electron moved. But if you have a topological state, then you know small deformations don't affect it. That is the property of a topological state. And that is what these quantum spin liquids um, give us. They give us topological states where deformations are not affecting the properties of that state. Okay. A few words about the excitations and uh, how do we see that the excitations are fractionalized? Okay, let me just flash a couple, one or two pictures here. So here is that ordered antiferromagnet. Okay, if I take a spin and flip it, I change a down spin, let's say, into an up spin. I have changed the angular momentum from minus half h bar 
to plus half H bar, that's a change of one H bar. So what you get are these <clears throat> spin excitations that carry H bar amount of angular momentum. And these spin waves um, have very definite energy and momentum. So let's see, when you take a ball and you throw it with some momentum P, you know it has energy P square over two M, right? It goes like P square. These spin waves behave a little bit like light. When you have uh, photons, the energy is linearly proportional to P. And it's something similar here. Here's the energy of the spin waves. They are, it's this uh, horizontal axis is momentum. It's going linearly dispersing here as a function of momentum. It's like light. But also what is remarkable is if I pick a certain momentum here and I, it has that state has a very definite energy. So energy and momentum are very closely wired. In a spin liquid, what happens is this is the spin liquid state. I've just shown one configuration. The excitations are made by breaking these singlets and making them into triplets. And so what you get is a fractionalization of this um, spin excitations or what are called magnons that carry integer quantum uh, of uh, angular momentum into two quanta with h bar over two. And because you now have created two quanta, um, you don't get sharp peaks anymore. So let me try to explain what is happening here. Like say um, you pick a certain momentum and you would have liked to see this much energy. That energy can now be fractionalized into two of these H bar over two excitations that are called spin-ons. So if you had a certain amount of energy, say 10 units of energy, you can, you can break it up into two spin-ons in many ways. One could be zero and 10, one and nine, et cetera, et cetera. So you no longer get a sharp peak, you get a broad band of energies. Same thing in the other direction, you create a state with a certain energy, it can be broken up into two spin-ons carrying different momenta. So you, you have lost the sharp excitations and a very clear signature of fractionalization are these broad uh, featureless continua. Okay, so I'm coming to the very end. I want to share with you a picture of my group right now. This, uh, my research in um, quantum spin liquids began in um, just 2018. This is when I got excited about this particular topic. Of course, I was doing other things before that that was building up toward this. But this is the specific uh, time my group decided to get into this, this area. And I want to bring this up for all of you to see that research is a very collaborative activity with stu students who are at the level of graduate students, undergrads, also postdocs. And um, you know, we work on different threads and all of these threads come together in presenting a bigger picture then. And also we don't just work in vacuum, there is related work by many other groups and then you often have uh, meetings and conferences. It's a very global activity. It's not restricted to one area. Or it's like globally happening all over the world. And now with all of this internet activity uh, and connectivity, it's uh, very easy to get information on what is happening at other places. So we are working in a collaborative mode. Okay. So I think I want to kind of end uh, by uh, just uh, uh, telling you where is quantum information and how does this fit into it. So a lot of you would have seen the reports about a 53 superconducting qubit computer that Google has made. Uh, what is important to realize is that this already is a major landmark that we have um, uh, these uh, multiple qubits, you know, it went from one qubit to at some point nine and all the way now we have 53 qubits. And what is important is on a particular task, this super, this um, uh, quantum computer has outperformed a classical computer um, by uh, orders of magnitude. So that's already very exciting. But these qubits are 
connected to the environment and they can decohere because they are constantly interacting with the environment, they are jiggling. That same jiggling is happening here. And that is bad for the system. So this is where quantum spin liquids will provide not just qubits, but what are called topological qubits. And the advantage of a topological qubit is that they are um, not affected by the environment. And that is a huge development. It has not happened yet. It is happening. The first report is on the archive. And you can see the words topological order, revolutionize the understanding of quantum matter, quantum error correcting codes. So we, do, if you had topological qubits, you would not need quantum error correction. So this is a huge development and it's on the archive right now. Okay, so to conclude, I would like, this is my take home message for you. Quantum spin liquid is a new state of matter. First thing is you must reveal the spin and that requires a MOT insulator. Then you must have quantum fluctuations so that the system will not order. Otherwise the system will get into an ordered up, down, up, down state, but you want that order to be disrupted by these quantum fluctuations. And the third thing is you want this linear superposition. You want like a liquid-like property. The important thing is this is not a liquid at high temperatures. All of this is happening at the lowest temperature. The spins are not ordering because of quantum fluctuations. So you have this liquid entanglement. So all of these three elements give you the spin liquid. And ultimately, these are some keywords and concepts entanglement, you knew about conductors and band insulators, and now you know about MOT insulators, singlets and bell pairs, and quantum spin liquid. And some other words to research further are topology in quantum matter, fractionalized excitations, anions, and braiding. So I hope with that, that you've seen something new, and there's a lot more new things to learn about. So. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm happy to take as many questions as you have. Thank you, Nandini. A very nice talk. And I think it has uh, aroused the like, excitement and curiosity of people. There are a lot of questions. So let's see how many we can take. So one, uh, one uh, question is, uh, can there be entanglement in particles like protons in other element, uh, par elementary particles? Yeah, um, there can be um, uh, entanglement basically at, between not just electrons, you can have protons, you can also have atoms. All of these can also be put into entangled states. Yes. And somebody wants to ask. And also about photons, also photons. So then, uh, is, I, uh, please elaborate a little about magnons. What are its applications? So magnons, um, so magnons, um, so first of all, phonons are the excitations coming from lattice vibrations. And phonons basically carry heat. So, you know, your coffee cup, you know, which is an insulator carries heat because of phonons carrying that heat. Magnons, in addition to carrying heat, also carry spin. So you can have spin transport. Okay, now what is an application? It's very important. You know, we have all heard about electronics that drives all our applications. And electronics is about uh, charges and how they move. But as charges move, they also heat up, you know? But in these insulators, as we were talking, there is no charge motion, only spin motion. That has led to the birth of a field called spintronics. So these magnons can carry information from one side to another without ever moving charge. So that is remarkable. 
you can be moving information from one place to another just by changing the way spins are flopping on the different sites. That's like spin waves, but charge has not hopped from one site to another. That is what causes joule heating, I square R. So if I is zero, there's no joule heating, but you are still moving information. And this is a whole field that you can research called spintronics created by magnons. Please explain more about electron fractionalization in two dimensions, where a single electron break up into three parts. Okay. Um, so this is, um, let me say it in very short right now, but uh, the place to look up more on this is the fractional quantum Hall effect. And what happens there is, uh, so the system is very simple. It's a two dimensional electron gas, okay? And you apply a magnetic field perpendicular to that two dimension. And what that entails is um, as you raise the magnetic field, your uh, resistance becomes the Hall resistance. So usually you have, we have been talking right now about resistance. That was the, the usual resistance in the direction of the current motion. But you can also have a voltage developing in the transverse direction. So let's say in the X direction, I have a current. In the Z direction, I have a magnetic field. In the Y direction, you can develop a Hall voltage. And the Hall voltage divided by the current in the X direction is called the Hall resistance. And this Hall resistance gives plateaus at certain values, H over E. And then, so let's do it in terms of conductance, it's E square over H. That is the quantum of conductance. And the usual one would have been a, a certain um, you know, you get, um, you, you get these plateaus at E square over H, but the fractionalization happens when you get a plateau at E square over 3H at a third of that value. And that happens because the electron has now changed its character. And uh, this is a little bit longer story, but that is where the electron has broken up into three lumps. And you might say, how do we really see these three lumps? And there's a beautiful experiment. And the idea behind the experiment is uh, trying to, it's a bit like, it's a noise, it's a short noise experiment. So think of your tin roof and there's hailstorm coming down. And from the sound of the hail, tut, 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 you can tell, is it a big hail or is it tut, 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 tut. Ah, this, these are smaller hailstones. You can tell the size of the hail. So in quantum Hall effect, you can go from the integer state with big hail, which is uh, electrons of charge E, to at a higher magnetic field, a fractional uh, quantum Hall effect with much smaller uh, element, much smaller noise objects. And that is the fractionalized electron. So this has been observed in a short noise experiment through the size of the short noise. So there's one more question uh, about Mott insulators and superconductors. So can Mott insulators be converted into a conductor or a band insulator? That's the first part of the question. And the second is, is there a critical temperature or critical magnetic field of transition like in superconductors? Okay, these are both excellent questions. So something I didn't talk about, but actually these MOT insulators, um, let's see if that picture might help. Yeah, so this is the MOT insulator. And now you can, what is called dope it, you can remove this half filling condition where if there are, N sites, there are N electrons here. There are N over two up and N over two down, but it's half filled. If you remove some of the electrons, that's called doping it. And then the system becomes conducting 
and in fact, even becomes superconducting. And uh, this is another very fascinating story of a high temperature superconductor. So um, superconductivity, as, we, as I mentioned, is this pairing of electrons. And um, the question is um, how high, at what temperature does it happen? And that temperature typically is on the order of 10 Kelvin. And rather remarkably, two decades back, in this lanthanum copper oxide, this MOT insulator, when you dope it and make it conducting, the system actually ended up becoming a superconductor at a very high temperature. That temperature has now reached about 160 Kelvin. So the question was, is that superconductor the same as the superconductor we knew about earlier? And the answer is no. It's actually a very different superconductor, which is, which is closely tied to this quantum spin liquid. So um, essentially the superconductor has, you know, you might say, if I have repulsion, I talked all in the MOT insulator about repulsion. What, how can you get uh, superconductivity? Well, you can see that even out of this repulsion, there is magnetism and out of magnetism, there is entanglement. And that entanglement is a kind of Cooper pair. So that's the Cooper pair. And uh, in between, and so you end up getting these singlets which form Cooper pairs. But if it was all singletized, that would have just been a spin liquid. There are some holes in it. And because of the presence of these holes, you get superconductivity. So there's a very intimate relation between spin liquids and high TC superconductivity. I think that was a, that should have answered. Okay, so uh, another question is, how do we detect the spin being carried? How do we detect that the spin is being carried? Um, yeah, so you detect it uh, by several means. Let me just tell you, tell, since I showed this picture, let me um, um, bring this. So what you do, the way this picture is made, is you, sh you shine neutrons. So just to kind of give you the, you know, we have electrons, then we talked about the atom. The atom has a proton and a neutron. And a neutron has a property that it is neutral, that's the name, but it carries spin. So, so you, what you do is you shine neutrons that carry spin. So that's angular momentum, S, and it carries linear momentum and energy, okay? So it carries some momentum P1 and some energy E1. It scatters with your material and goes off with an energy E2 and momentum uh, P2 and some change in, in its spin as well. So you look at that difference between what went in and what came out and the difference is what was dumped on the material. So now you take the difference and that's what tells you this much momentum was linear momentum, this much energy, as well as you know, if the neutron underwent a spin flip, it must have dumped one H bar of energy to the one H bar of uh, angular momentum to the system. That's how you know the spin waves carry angular momentum. So maybe one last one. How do you justify liquid in, uh, you know, I think the Luttinger liquid in terms of the associated forces? Um, so I didn't talk about Luttinger liquids. That's a little different story. Um, but uh, the, the main point to make here is that the, the uh, interactions that you write down at an elementary level are not new. They are just what we know, Coulomb interactions. But the fractionalized states that emerge come about because of effectively novel kinds of interactions and gauge potentials. Okay, so all of these spin liquids and uh, are described by effectively, if you write an effective Hamiltonian that has uh, various kinds of uh, effective gauge theories that describe these Hamiltonians. 
but the elementary interactions are just what we learn about. The emergence happens because there are many degrees of freedom and there are constraints. You see, when you have some kind of constraints, like one dimension, since you asked about Latinja liquids, Latinja liquids happen in one dimensional wires. And if you have ever tried to walk on a pathway that is in one dimension, you will bump into somebody and there's no going around them. So one dimensions, one dimensional systems are very strongly correlated systems. And so because of these constraints, you have to, you get some effective modes, which uh, are quite different from the original modes. So thank you, Nandini. Uh, I think you know there are a lot of questions were there. So now I would like to hand over to Vandana. So uh, what I would like to say is I'm sure you all have wonderful questions and I would love to be able to um, you know interact more and listen to them more. So you can always send me an email. I'm very willing to discuss that. And also on questions related to, um, you know, specific role of being a woman in science or just, uh, you know, any other questions related to careers and pathways, I would be very happy to also look at that, uh, to answer that. Thank you very much, Nandini, for a really a very wonderful talk. And first of all, accepting our request to deliver a talk in Vigyan Vidushi. I must oh, add my here, pleasure. I must remind here to uh, also that actually when Nandini was at TIFR, she was one of the persons who played a very important role in sort of initiating women in physics moment, if I may term so. And at least that was the time even IUPAP started forming the uh, doing the nation, uh, international surveys and getting people together so she has been associated for this cause and working for this cause for a long time i just want to add to what sumeda already said is that yes there have been many questions and it has been a very nice interactive session and informative for our students at the same time there are many many appreciative comments on the youtube so as we had uh, expected and people have said that your talk has been very inspirational and particularly I should add that the way in the beginning you talked about uh, how to get into the career and what motivated you and how you went about, I am sure this will be very, very useful to our uh, Thank you. participants Thank and all you. the viewers. And the talk remains uh, available for all those interested to watch on YouTube. So please do pass on the, uh, if you have found it interesting, please pass on the link to your other friends and ask them to subscribe to Vigyan Vidushi channel so that they can hear the, uh, get the notifications for the future channels. So on behalf of uh, Vigyan Vidushi organizers, I thank uh, today's speaker, Professor Nandini Trivedi once more. And I also thank Professor Sumeda, who is actually one of the Vigyan Vidushi member team. She was a tutor last year. And she is herself works in the theoretical statistical mechanics and interdisciplinary applications and is currently a faculty at Nicer Bhuvaneshwar. So thank you, Sumedha, for conducting the talk so nicely. And thank, thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you. I really appreciated the questions as well. So thank you. And thank you, Vandana, for uh, running this whole program. Thanks, Rajdeep. Well, it's a big team which is there thank with you. us. And uh, thanks to thank TFR for letting you. us do it. Yeah. So we have a next special lecture on 10th June and that will be by Professor Shubhavati Goswami on women in science breaking barriers. So see you all then. And of course, we get Vidushi students. They have a next class, I mean, next session at 6. Prasna, some of the students are asking if they can have Nandini's email ID. Yes. So uh, that, I, as, as we mentioned also, that we will make it available on the Moodle in the, the resources available to all the special uh, speakers. Uh, uh, email IDs will be made available to them. I also have a Twitter handle, guys. Um, you know, you may not have guessed that, but I am on Twitter. Nandini, you want to put that in the chat box? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, let me just, uh, I, I have to remember it. It's either Nan, one way or Nandini Trivedi, but there are some, sometimes it is Trivedi Nandini. So I just want to. Well, they can hunt it, hunt for it. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Trivedi Nandini. At Trivedi Nandini with that handle. All right. Let me put it in chat. Because I will also put that in the YouTube then one minute. So I've also put it in the YouTube chat so people have that information. All right. Thank you very much.